Hi everybody, welcome to the last video in Calculus 3, section 17.8, Divergence Theorem. This is not going to be a very long section. Right, so what we have in this section, uh, what we have is a surface integral, and when we have the normal vector, is the flux. Right, Divergence Theorem. Let F be a vector field whose component have first have continuous first partial derivative in a connected simply connected region D and closed by a smooth oriented surface S. So in this case, S is the boundary of D. So S is the boundary of D. Uh, D is the three-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional object, and then the, the boundary is on the outside. A uh, two-dimensional object is a surface, so a surface enclosed the three-dimensional region D. Right. Then we have the flux, because the normal vector is the flux, or the surface integral equal to a triple integral of the delta dot v, uh, delta dot v dot f. Sorry, this is the diversion of f. So that's why we call this a uh, diversion theorem. So the idea here is kind of like the Green theorem or the Stokes theorem. Instead of doing the surface integral on the boundary. Instead of doing on surface integral on the boundary, we're going to do the triple integral for the interior. So of course, D is the interior. And the price to pay is the divergent of the vector field. So, just like the green theorem, instead of doing the line integral on the boundary, uh, we do the double integral for the inside. And the Stokes theorem, kind of the same thing. Instead of doing it on the boundary, we do it in the interior. So all of that, but uh, the difference here is was that function, right? Let's look at uh, an example. Uh, consider the radial field. So that field. Let S be a uh, the sphere, radius a centered at zero zero zero, uh, and close the region D. Uh, assume that n is the our normal vector. So this time we have the normal vector that pointing out. Evaluate both integral of the divergence. So first we're going to do the left hand side, then we'll do the right hand side. They're supposed to be equal. All right. So on the left hand side, first thing we see is the surface integral. So the first step always parameterize. I parameterize the surface S, which is a sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to a squared. Then uh, we see this a lot. If you see this in the homework, just go to section six seventeen point six. Example to C. Okay. So the parameterization of the sphere is that. So this is uh, once again section seventeen point six. Uh, example two C. So in that section, what we have is the parameterization of the sphere using phi antenna, which 
కాపీ చేసిన యాడ్ ఓకే షూట్ ఫర్ స్మూల్ హీ ఏ సాయి ఫాయి కో సాయి థేరా ఏ సాయి ఫాయి సాయి థేరా and a cosine phi uh, we're talking about the whole sphere so phi between zero the north pole and pi the south pole theta complete revolution from zero to to pi All right so that is the parameterization of the sphere next uh, we will write the vector field in term of the parameters the vector field is x1 z we will write this in terms of the parameters so this is x1 z so pretty much the same as that a sine cosine a sine sine a cosine all right so the vector field is given in the parameters so those step kind of almost the same on every line or surface integral problem next is the nds so just want to write n is the cross product of the derivative of this we expect to find cross derivative of the same thing with respect to theta with respect to the parameters and we do the cross product and also in section 17.6 uh, we have the normal vector is equal to a sine uh, so also in 17.6 the normal vector is equal to a sine phi times r uh, So this is in 17.6 the sample 2c as well the only thing that i need to verify is that i make a little typo here because n is equal to a sine phi r i forgot there is a square here yeah so please go back to page 146 or section 17.6 example 2c or 2 example c example 2 I will write this page 147 yeah so like that make sure that is square here pretty much when we multiply a sine phi to it that makes sine square right so in this case that normal vector is equal to a sine phi and then times r a sine phi cosine theta a sine phi sine theta a sine cosine right so make it a square sine square this will save you a lot of time doing homework or maybe even test originally there's no sign theta here it's just a cosine now when we multiply in that will be sign So sorry, this is just a sine, a cosine theta. But yet to test. Yeah, I just copy R here. So this is cosine. Of fine. All right. So now we have everything. Parameterization. The vector field is. In terms of the parameters, normal vectors is in terms of parameters. All we need to do is just do the dot product, and then that's it. So, 
flux. Be equal to. Now first we write the vector field in terms of the parameter. I forgot one important thing times the normal vector. Or the normal vector in this case is just the gross product of those two. And then d phi d theta phi go from 0 to pi. Uh, theta go from 0 to 2 pi. Right. Right. I forgot one thing. Even though in the problem I already underlined twice. Make sure that the normal vector is pointing out. So how do we know if it's pointing out? I just think about this. If we have a sphere, right? If it is on the upper hemisphere, the z will point up. If it is on the bottom hemisphere, the normal vector will point down. So that means pointing outside the sphere, right? If it is above, it points up. If it is below, it points down. Right. Now in that case, we're just going to check real quick. Or even if it is on the boundary, it will point outside. I mean, if it is on the equator, you point outside. So what we check real quick is if we just pick uh, theta to be some, I mean, pick phi to be something on the top, for example. If we choose phi to be pi over 4, that certainly will be on the top, right? On the upper hemisphere. If it is upper hemisphere, uh, theta, I mean phi will be from 0 to pi. 0 to pi over 2. So, now. Upper sphere, upper hemisphere. That is where theta, when phi is between 0 and pi over 2. So in this case, what I'm going to check to make sure that this is a normal vector pointing out. Actually, we already checked this in 17.7. .7. We did something similar to this. In this case, let's do that again. Let's choose phi to be, uh, for example, For example, let phi be pi over 4. So this is going to be on the upper hem hemisphere, on the upper hemisphere. Now put pi over 4 and pi over 4 here. What do we have? Now just focus on this one. At pi over 4, we have a sine pi over 4, cosine pi over 4. Side pi over 4 is positive, cosine pi over 4 is positive. A uh, we assume it's positive. Also, the radius is A, so it's positive. So this is positive. So what do we have? What we have was, what we have is uh, where the point is about that, the Z component. This is Z component of it. It's positive, meaning that it point up. So which is good. Yeah, so we just have to choose a point and test them to see if the vector, the, the direction of the normal vector is consistent to what the question asks. This one, we want the normal vector pointing outward. So this is pointing above, point up, below, points down. That's exactly when it say pointing outward. And the divergent theorem only works if the our normal vector, if the normal pointing outside. Right, so that's good. So we don't need to change anything. If we happen to have a negative, we have to negate everything, change everything to opposite. Right. Now it should be easy. Uh, we're just going to take the dot product. Of vector field F in terms of phi and theta.
dot with the normal vector in terms of phi and theta will be that. And d phi d theta. Right. Pretty much we want to write r and that. So those two. So a cube size times size or sine cube cosine cosine. first one next second and second a cube sine cube and sine square sine theta square and then the next one a I forgot the square here right sorry So to be a squared times say a cube, uh, cosine squared, but there's sine and cosine squared. Uh, we can use for binary theorem here, but let's just simplify it first. Right. Uh, let's look at this. We have a cube sine cube so the cosine square and sine square just factor those two out we have a cube sine cube sine square plus cosine square and then we have a cube sine Cosine square. Right. Cosine square plus cosine square is one. And then those two, we can factor out a cube and sine phi. A cube sine. And then we have sine square left. Put a cube sine out, we have cosine square left. And then cosine square. D phi, D theta. Okay. Sine square plus cosine square is one. So we just have a cube and sine. So we're going to have zero to two pi, zero to pi, a cube, sine, and of course, for B theorem, right? Constant limit separable function. Uh, a cube is constant. And then there's no theta. And then integral from 0 to pi of sine. Uh, so we have a cube uh, integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta. So that's just theta from 0 to 2 pi. We did plenty of this. That is 2 pi. And the last one is 2, I think. Right.
for that too. So we have what? Uh, 4 pi a cube. Right, so uh, that is the surface integral. If we use the left hand side, that's what we have. Right, by the way, parameterize, as mentioned before, parameterize a sphere. Uh, that is very important example. So uh, if we just write like that, it is on the surface of the sphere, so that's why the radius A is constant. So we only have two parameters, phi and theta. And the normal vector is given by that form. And then we just follow the problem. So that's what we have. All right. Next, we're going to do the left-hand side. Now we do the triple integral on the interior, right? But the price for that is the diversion of f. So if f is x, y, and z, so diversion of f, or the dot product between the del operator and f, the dot product, the del operator, partial derivative with respect to x, y, z and vector field f is x, y, and z so when we do this we just have derivative of x with respect to x derivative of y with respect to y and derivative of z with respect to z so we just have 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal to 3 right so the version of f is 3 so bottom line is we have triple integral the version of f and sometimes I write the bone face because after all the del operator is a vector so you can write that as a vector if you want to so what will be the boundary here so we're talking about the sphere of radius a right so here we can say this is a sphere of radius A. But by the way, including the interior, I should say the boundary here, even though the picture is not good enough, we have to say this is the ball of radius A. center at zero 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 yeah so we're talking about the sphere the interior of the sphere which is the actually the boundary and the interior of the sphere so the whole ball a solid object it turns out that we only have three I mean that is three right And factor out three, we have the sphere, and uh, the ball, sorry. And this is the volume of the ball. Radius A. So that's why we just have pi and the area, I mean the volume of the pole, a ball, is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Yeah. So let's see. Volume of a ball, radius r. Yeah, so that is the volume of the ball. In that case, just 4 third pi r cubed and 3 and 3 cancel out. We have 4 pi r cubed, which is consistent to what we have before when we do the surface integral. Right? So, sometimes it's really very nice if we just use 
the triple in the floor, we just find the volume of the object. If the vector field is nice enough, it is very easy to uh, calculate. Right, let's look at the second example. Uh, use the divergent theorem to compute the net hour flux. So the flux, of course, is the double integral, I mean the surface integral, f dot n ds. And this is on the hour. We don't really worry about that because this time we do this, the triple integral then uh, we don't worry about uh, the normal vector. The normal vector only matters if it is on the left-hand side and it has to be pointing outside for us to use the divergent theorem. The divergent theorem only works if the vector pointing, uh, the normal vector pointing outside of the surface. Right. Now, but this time we talk about the surface. S is the surface of a cube that is cut from the first octant. So, that case, let's just write out again f dot n ds. We talk about the cube, the surface of the cube. The divergent theorem say that this is equivalent to the triple integral for the version of f some dv. Yeah. Would I write uh, the del operator dot f or diversion of f? Same thing. But the triple integral is no longer on the boundary. But we're talking about the interior. Yeah. So interior of the whole cube. This is just boundary. This one is on the interior of the cube. Right, let's just do the diversion of f first and see what is that. Diversion of f, del operator dot f, del operator uh, vector field f x square plus 2xy y square I don't know why I write like that where the vector field is clearly x square to xz and y square Right, so partial derivative with respect to x of x square, partial derivative of 2xz with respect to y of y square with respect to z. Of course, there's no y here and there's no z there, so 0, 0. The only thing that we have is just 2x. So the diversion is 2f, I mean 2x. And of course, we'll just substitute that back in for the diversion of f. Uh, so, to continue this, uh, we will say, it. actually let's start from the beginning. And dot, dot, dot equal to the interior of a cube. And then divergent is 2x dv. Right, so this is cut from the first octant. So we only talk about this octant. And this is a cube.
talking about that cube or just a cube like this uh, so pretty much uh, it is cut from the first octant meaning x and y and z equal to zero to x equal to one y equal to one z equal to one so those are the limits zero to one zero to one zero to one up to x uh, doesn't matter though on a constant let's say to reverse alphabetical order And also for binary theorem, uh, constant limit only depends on x. So first we group the x first, and then y, and then z. Uh, integral of 2x from 0 to 1, so that is, should be 1. So this is 1, and integral from 0 to 1 of dy, so that is 1 times 1, and times 1. So it is just equal to 1. Yeah, so it's almost easy right so once again instead of doing the surface integral on the boundary we can do the triple integral for the interior uh, interior of course we know the limit in this case you set up and um, simplify that a lot usually in this this one is easier than to do than the other one because the vector field we do that divergent it might simplify but this is in terms of interior this will be a lot easier to do if you want to do that on the surface integral, remember this is the cube. A cube has six faces, meaning in order to do this, we have to do six surface integral. Each one of them is a square. So we have to do that for six faces of the cube. Of course, certainly you don't want to do that, so just do that for the interior. In that case, the interior, the limit is very easy to set up, and that's it. Right. Remember, the divergent theorem only works if the normal vector pointing out. Right. So let's consider this case. I suppose the vector field F satisfies the condition of the divergent theorem of everything on the fine print. This is bounded by two smooth surfaces S1 and S2. S1 lies within S2. So we're talking about S1 within S2. Let S be the entire surface. So S is the surface of S2 and S1. Uh, let n1 and n2, this will be both face, be the our normal vector. So originally we want the normal vector pointing out. And if it pointing out the n1 actually It's not that. I mean, this one is pointing inside the surface. Huh. If it's pointing outside, it will be that. However, this is pointing inside of. I'm talking about the region S. With respect to S. The normal vector actually point outside this, but with respect to the region S1, that's one actually pointing in. So it depends on we're talking about the region S, kind of like the donut in between. So for example, I'm talking if I, I cannot draw 3D like this. I can look at the 2D dimension. We have the curve C2 and curve C1, right? Now we have the normal vector pointing outside. Now if we talk about pointing outside of this region here, 
then with respect to that the vector that normal vector that point outside is point that direction if we talk about with respect to the home region now but with respect to the C1 itself that actually point inside so we have to reverse that so bottom line is depends on where we're talking about this region in between or it, the region in inside with respect to the region inside that point in that's one outside but with respect to the region inside that is inside so different so the divergent over the region in between is equal to surface integral uh, so that's why we have to do the surface integral on s2 with point outside and minus the surface integral on s1 because if we want this vector actually that one is pointing inside of the surface point inside of the curve right but point inside of the surface so that's why we have to subtract that because with respect to the region inside of C1, that vector is pointing inside. But with respect to this region in between, that vector is pointing inside. I mean, that vector is pointing outside of the region in between. Right. So that's why we have to uh, negate one of them, negate the interior. Because N1 pointing outside. N1 for S1, that is pointing inside of the region in between but we need the opposite of that which is outside of the region in between the version only works if it is outside normal vector right. and that's what i want to cover for the version theorem once again instead of instead of doing the surface integral on the surface on the power outside we can just do the triple integral for the interior. Right. Now, so this chapter, chapter 17, we study about line integral and surface integral. Of course, the line integral is a single integral. The surface integral, double integral. Right. So, now, there will be two versions of it. The one on the left is the scalar function. You see f is a scalar function, ds is a scalar function. Like why f and ds, all of them are scalar function. On over here we have the vector version. We have the vector field f instead of the function f. Vector field f instead of the function f. So that's why the notation is extremely important. So when we look at the problem we know what we're dealing with. Both of them are line integral. We have the scalar version and the uh, vector version of it. Now, let's focus on uh, the big scheme of things. The first one is always parameterize the surface or parameterize the line, the line on the surface. When we know that, we have to know what the parameters. Now, the scalar function, the characterize of that is the tangent vector. So for line to grow, we have the tangent vector. That is the tangent vector also. So, the characterization of the line integral is given by the tangent vector. Opposed to the characterization of the surface integral is given in the normal vector. And the normal vector is given by the cross product of uh, derivative of this respect to u cross derivative of this respect to v. The reason we use t is because that is the tangent vector in the u direction cross the tangent vector in the v direction. So, pretty much that. Right? And also when we have the surface integral with n, uh, the normal vector, that's flux integral. Right? Because there are a lot of different forms of uh, line and surface integral. Right? Now, all the things that to go with it, and each one of them is another section in this chapter. So, fundamental term of line integral. 
So there's a few important things. Uh, so first, uh, if the vector field F is conservative, if it is conservative, there is phi, which is a potential function. And it is potential function, meaning that the gradient of phi is equal to the vector field f. Right. And because there's a potential function, it is independent of path. So that's why the direction, it doesn't matter. Uh, this will be c, sorry. So this is independent of path. So direction doesn't matter. I mean, the the path connecting them doesn't matter. What matters is the endpoints. And finally, uh, the line integral for a closed curve so if f is conservative there is a potential function and use the potential function to evaluate the endpoint and subtract them we have the uh, integral so in this case we don't have to parameterize and do anything if we have the potential function evaluate the endpoint subtract them that's it now because it doesn't matter to go, go from A to B. It doesn't matter. Let's say we go from here to here, A to B, right? And then we take the direction from from A to B on this round. But we're going to reverse that from B to A. Of course, I should say the integral from A to B is the opposite to from B to A because it's independent of path if we turn this backward A to B, A to B, those are the same but if we go A to B and then B to A opposite it doesn't matter which direction you go uh, it's going to be equal to zero so on a closed curve this is equal to zero if there's a potential function, then the line to grow on the closed curve is equal to zero. And if we use line to grow, we can put a circle there just to indicate the circulation. All right. So that is our fundamental theorem of line to grow. Uh, the green theorem, uh, the green theorem, only works for two dimension. Only works on R two. And so once again, instead of evaluate on the boundary, we just do that and evaluate in the interior. So C here is boundary, and R here is interior. The price to pay here is that, which is the third component of the cross product. So when we do the cross product, uh, we do the curl, that's the third component. Right, stock theorem, likewise, on the boundary, as is the interior. But this interior is in three-dimensional space, in R3. And the divergent theorem say, Instead of doing the surface on the boundary, that enclose the interior D. So, let us see, all those three theorem kind of the same thing. Uh, the difference between this is, this, those two are line to grow, and those are the circulation, meaning that uh, it's a closed curve and um, go around the parameters by the tangent vector. So once again, the tangent vector 
uh, the line integral is characterized by the tangent vector, uh, whereas in the surface integral, the characterization is in terms of the normal vector. So that's what we have. Uh, so S is boundary of D, C is boundary of S, and C is boundary of R here. Right. And of course, so the step to evaluate line or surface integral parameterization, first, we need to know what are the parameters for the line or for the surface. Next, we write a function or the vector in terms of t. Right, so everything in terms of t. And then we calculate that part. Either the magnitude, if we do the scalar version. So when we have the absolute values or the magnitude, that only for the scalar function. Uh, for the vector field, we don't do that. We just take derivative and then do the dot product. Whatever come out, we evaluate from A to B. Uh, for the surface integral, we're going to use the normal vector. So parameterize the surface, write the vector field and the normal vector in terms of u and v, and then evaluate for a uh, limit of u and v. Yeah. Yes, in this case, uh, we have the normal vector is equal to tu cross tv. forget those uh, theorem. Uh, yeah, when we use those theorem, the calculation is a lot easier. Right. So green theorem, light integral on the surface equal to the, the interior. The Stoke theorem, the uh, Stoke theorem is works in 3D. In R3. But, so that's why we're here. Yeah, so even though we just go from that into the interior, but we have to write uh, those three things. Those three things that allows us to move from uh, one integral to the other. Right, so uh, that's pretty much uh, all I want to cover for calculus three. Uh, for one last time, thank you for watching.